We want to thank our manager, David Snowden. Hey, David, tell me about your first record, buddy. Oh, I don't even remember what my first record was that I bought. Um, I don't want to say I came from a musical family because I don't. Uh, right. My mother always liked to listen to music. Her favorite artist was Elvis. Wow. I had an older sister who was severely handicapped who loved music and had a huge record collection. Okay. And she was always playing music all the time. And that's what gave her a lot of joy. So it just kind of progressed, and then in 1970, what was that, 1976, when Kiss did to Paul Lynn, came in and sat down and started watching TV, and Paul Lynn came on, because the variety show's really big in the 70s, so you watched them all, and to see Kiss on there, then I was like, I like that. And that's, that's awesome. what got me hooked on to Kiss. Awesome. How old were you by then? I was 11 years old. Okay. So, and then, you know, kept following the band. And then in 1979, I was 13 and I got to go see him in concert for the first time, which was the Dynasty show. And that's the one that they included in uh, one of the uh, Kissologies, which is kind of cool. You think about it. The first concert you ever saw, you now have a nice professional video of it to be able to yeah. watch that over and over. Yes, and do you remember something about that? What do you remember? Well, my mother didn't want to take us, and neither did my father, so she had my cousin take us. And every time they started a new song, I would tell her what the song was, and she, the biggest thing I remember is her looking at me saying, do you ever shut up? <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> You're a true Keys fan, man. We're all the same. Yeah. But I, I was so excited, and I thought my cousin, she was a couple years older. You know, she was 19, 20 years old, and she wasn't really into the band. And I wanted her to know what song they were playing. And, uh, you know, our seats were pretty high up, but, you know, the whole thing of you go and you see your favorite band, it's just the best hey, thing. Tell me, what do you remember? What's the biggest. Uh, you, you know, the concert. biggest thing I remember walking away with was how they came up out of the stage. You know, each one had their little color and the way that they came up and then the lights went out. Peter's behind the drums, everybody's in the front. Ace is kicking it off with King of the Nighttime World and it, you know, hell. And that was also one of the shows, too, that they, all four of them played something from the solo album. You know, because later on they ended up dropping you know, some of the songs, so. Yeah, well, and then they stopped playing those songs. You know, well, they continued with New York Groove and uh, Radioactive, but move on and uh, Tulsa and Turning got dropped, so. I never felt this way before.
what happened in 1980 with Kiss? Well, in 1980, of course, you know, Kiss was not news anymore in the United States, but I still loved the band. And the Kiss Army was still around. And then by the end of 1980, 1980, you were getting notices that the Kiss Army was dissolving. Then it was a matter of you'd pick up the magazines like Circus Magazine, Hip Parader, and you'd start looking in the back. People had classifieds. Then I started seeing things for advertisements for fanzines. Yes. And I started to join some of those. Oh, cool. And you would get some of your Kiss news. Like, that's how I heard that Kiss Killers came out. And I went to every record store and called everybody to find out who had it so I could go get the four new songs that they have with the greatest hits. And eventually I started to realize that I thought I could do something like that. Yes. And, you know, I had subscribed to a lot of European magazines that uh, had a lot of Kiss news that people didn't know about here. And that's when I started a KISS newsletter that was called the KISS Revolution. Got that started. And I was probably about six months into it when um, Keith LaRue called me and said that he was starting up a KISS merchandising business called KISS Off. And he said, how about if we get together and we take what you're doing with the newsletters and we make a full-fledged fan club thing. He just did, he invited me out to Indianapolis uh, for his kiss uh, for his kiss expo that he did back in May. Yes, the kiss in the expo. Yes, and then he invited me up to the New Jersey one that he's involved with uh, with Peter Arquette where they're going to do the New Jersey expo with Ace is going to be there, Bobby Rock's going to be there again, Lita Ford's going to be there. So it's going to be a lot of fun to be able to go to that. I'll help Bob out some and, uh, you know, keep him straight for the whole duration like I did in Indy. You and Keith are always down to earth with the fans. Well, I think that, you know, neither one of us take anything for granted either. I mean, you grow up, you love a band, and it's a lot of fun to be able to converse with other people that love the same stuff. And... You know, it's, it's part of your mentality. I mean, people can give you awards, they can tell you how great you are, but it really doesn't mean anything. I mean, you know, you, you appreciate it. I don't want you to take that the wrong way. It mean, you know, it, exactly. it means something, but in the big scope of things, it's all about the relationships that you have with people. I mean, I got to live so many things that, you know, a lot of people don't. I mean, nowadays you pay for meet and greets, and you expect the bands to be nice to you, but back in the 80s, that didn't happen. Yeah, you've met Vinnie Vincent, haven't you, since you recorded his song? Oh, Vinnie uh, Vinny moved out here, by the way. Yeah, Vinnie's a... Uh, if um, you ever talk to Vinnie, if you ask him about it, we've spent... Um, when Vinnie first quit Kiss, I guess it was... Um, well, actually, last February, I got to be good friends with him. And um, he gave me his home phone number, and we got to talking almost every day on the phone for months. And... Oh. Um, now, I just did an interview with him last uh, January 25th, not last Saturday, Saturday before that, and um, uh, he's been just fantastic with us. Matter of fact, um, one of the things that we're doing with him is um, in Faces in June, they have a two-page spread on Vinny, and we're putting a, yeah, we're going to put a full-page ad in there to congratulate him. I like him. He's, good. he's a great guitar player. He just got a good record deal. Oh, uh, he does. Uh, <laughs> huh? Uh, I said he does with Chrysalis. You know, yeah, he's got a great deal. The, the I mean, amount of games. I like, he wrote a song for me. I mean, he wrote Tears for me on my Let, it, Let Me Rock You album. Mm -hmm. And uh, then John Waite read it. If I thought my version was better. <laughs> I think so, too. I, I like Vinny's writing. I think he's a great writer, and I think he's a great guitar player. And I put him right up there. He's a, he's a top guy. And I'd like, you know, anything that you'd like from myself, I'd, I'd love to help you out, man. You know, back in the 80s, how was to be in touch with a musician or get an interview? You know, back in the day, we didn't have any emails or cell phones. Oh, it was it was fun. It was challenging um, because in doing the Kiss fan club, I I wanted to be have a chance to interview the bands and wanted to get to know what was going on and hear some of the stuff firsthand. And when they came to Baltimore on the Lick It Up tour, I called every hotel I could Very find. Nice asking for anybody on the road crew until I finally found and I was able to get through to Chris Lent's room. And Chris Lent was a business manager that was on tour with them. 
And I woke him up the first time. He wasn't real happy with me. I called back a couple hours later. He still wasn't real happy with me. Third time, he finally said to me, he said, David, what is it that you want? And I said, I want to meet the band. He said, I will leave you tickets and passes at the will call. And went backstage. Now, I had camped out the night before, and I waited all night to get KISS tickets, and I did have front row for that show, which was nice. Ended up doing that subsequent for, I did it for Lick It Up, for Animalize, and for Asylum when they played in Baltimore. But that first Baltimore show after Chris put me on the guest list, gave me the backstage pass as soon as I got there, picked up the tickets, picked up the passes, and went immediately backstage, and the first person who walked in was Gene Simmons. And here I was, 18 years old, and I got to meet Gene. He stood around, he talked to us, he was very friendly. He signed anything that we wanted. Um, I had some pictures. I had a huge Kiss collection at the time. I had pictures of the stuff, and I gave them to him. And I had my name and telephone number on the back of it. And about two weeks later, I got a call from somebody who said, um, I have some pictures, uh, Polaroid pictures of a Kiss collection that has your name and phone number on the back. And I said, yes. I said, I left them with Jean at the Baltimore show. And she said, oh, well, I have them all autographed wow, for you. Wow, how cool is that? She wanted to send them back to wow, me. Wow, unbelievable. Well, Jean gets, Jean gets a bad rap, but the bottom line is I think that he is a very fan-oriented person. Yes, he is. And I think he really does care. Absolutely. Because to give, you, to give you another example, on the Animalized tour, I flew up to uh, Massachusetts. And Keith and I got together, and we went to a whole bunch of shows together. And the show at the Worcester Centrum, when we went backstage at that, Bruce Kulick came in. And, you know, he hadn't shaved. He had just got up. He walked in. We started talking to him. We uh, always just such a great guy and just a gentleman. He always was. And... We said to Bruce, hey, you know, when your gig is over with this, we still want to cover you because you're still a part of the Kiss family. And he didn't really quite understand that. Then I told him, I said, you know, I have the two Blackjack albums, which surprised him. Nice. Um, didn't surprise him that I bought them both for a dollar <laughs> at a used record store. But, you know, Bruce was really great about that. Eric came in, always wanted to hang out. Yes. Eric's car. Yeah, Eric's he car. came in. He kept hanging out. Then Mark St. John came in. We were hanging out with them. We were, you know, conversing with everybody, getting autographs. And then Eric said he was going to go get ready. And then Gene walked in. And this is during the Animalized tour. And remember, he had just done the Runaway movie. Gotcha. So his hair was still really yes. short. Yes, indeed. And when he came out, we were like, Gene, can we get a picture? And he was like, I will give you whatever it is that you want, but I can't do any pictures because he wasn't done up for the yeah. stage. That's and we were like... That's fine. He even had somebody bring his bass guitar out, wow. one of his axe guitars. And Eric had given me some drumsticks. I had a couple of our newsletters in my hand. And Gene had somebody set it down on the ground, and I took pictures with that cool. because I thought, how cool, cool. is this? Yeah. You know? So I got to do all of that, and that was awesome. fun. You know? And Mark St. John gave me a little teardrop guitar pick, and... Um, he didn't have any with his name on it with the KISS logo because they were just doing, it was blank one side and the KISS logo on the other since, you know, Mark wasn't playing, but Bruce was. And so he actually pulled out of his pocket a teardrop guitar pick. And then he said, well, let me have it. And he took a silver marker and he wrote MN on it. And he went, oh, I wasn't supposed to do that because Mark Norton rather than Mark St. John. So, what a great story, man. Unbelievable. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> girls and guys, especially girls, Mark St. John, our lead guitar player. Hey, there he is. Hi, Australia. So, Mark, um, when you were asked to join the group, I mean, what were your first thoughts? I asked this to Eric about what, uh -huh. three years ago? Four. Four years ago. Please I was ahead. very flattered. I was yeah. really more than happy to come to New York and settle in here with the guys and start a new career. Right. Dishwashing. Now, there, was an, <laughs> there was an initiation. I hate to he think what it was. He didn't tell you about it. <laughs> That's, why right. That's why he's smiling. He goes, look at that big smile. Yeah. Well, like, yeah when, when Mark was in Kiss, there was no 
Kiss guitar picks at the time that set, had his signature on the back. And even the Bruce Kulick ones didn't happen until after the Detroit show. That's when they, they put his name on guitar picks after he was an official member of the band because his, his first day in the band was December 7th of that year. Yeah. So, what year was it? What year? Uh, that would be 84. 84, December yes. 7, 84. December, yeah, December 7th is when they did the Kobo Hall. Oh, the yeah. Animalized Live Uncensored. Correct. And that was the day that Bruce became an official member of KISS. After that, that Bruce finally got a guitar pick with his signature on. What was your favorite Kiss member at the time? I think initially, um, well, I'm, I'm going to start with Eric Carr. Oh, wow. When Peter Chris left and Eric Carr joined, that was exciting for me. There was a whole new character, a whole new guy. I started sending him letters right then, you know, back in 1980 when he joined the band. And Eric always really? responded, always sent you a letter back. A lot of times he would even send pictures that his roadie would take or he would go out sightseeing and take different pictures and he would always write something on the back and he would send them with the letters. Um, but to me, Eric Carr kind of lit a fire under Kiss's ass. Even though after that, the Elder came out, which wasn't quite what it was. But then, you know, Ace was always my favorite band member. And when he left... Yeah, it was a little disappointing, but at the same time, it was like, okay, well, here's this new guy. And then hearing some of his solos and seeing the way that he was doing it, it was like he was also breathing some new life in the kiss. And they were also back on track with the way that things were going. And when Lick It Up came out, that was an incredible album that I really loved. But I started to realize that really the heart and the soul of kiss, to me, was and still is Paul Stanley because show, he man. writes the best songs. You know, Gene has always been, to me, Gene Simmons is the face of Kiss because that is the most recognizable member of the band. Everybody sees his makeup face and they all make a big deal about it. But to me, Paul Stanley is, well, and Paul is, like I said, he's the heart and soul of Kiss. You know, where else do you get songs like Detroit Rock City? Love Gun, Creatures of the Night. I mean, that's all Paul Stanley. Genius, just a genius. I think Paul is, you know, a giant. That's the same level of uh, Freddie Mercury. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Paul is the ultimate front man. And, you know, not to take anything away from Gene. Gene is a great showman. You know, he does all the cool stuff. I mean, where else can you go to a concert and see some guy get up there breathe fire, spit blood, and then fly 50 feet up in the yeah, air. No I, that's great. And he jumps around the stage, he does his thing. But to me, it's like Paul has always been the home base yeah, for Kiss. He's the one who's always kept it alive. And it became very obvious to me, especially during Animalize, where you're transitioning <laughs> from one guitar player to another, and then Gene is off shooting a movie while they're doing an album. And I think that even when you listen to Animalize, there's some good Gene tracks on there, but the stuff that really shines are the Paul Stanley 100% stuff. 100% agree. And during the 80s, I mean, it was very apparent that Paul was writing the better stuff. Yes. And tell me about Ace. Yeah. What, 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 what do you remember about Ace? That's, that's just exciting stuff. I mean, even the first time I went to see Ace as a solo performer, Ace had set up to do Seven Cities back in 1985. He still hadn't officially unmasked to the world. This was even before the Laney Amp ads came out. Um, Ace went out and did Seven Cities. Uh, unfortunately, you know, when he was scheduled to play here in Baltimore, it was a 21 and over, and I still wasn't 21. Uh, so I went up to Scranton, Pennsylvania. And when I went to Scranton, I had tickets watched the show. It was great. This is when he was still a five-piece band. He had Alter Stead on the keyboards. Richie Scarlett was the original guitar player. 
John Regan was still there. Oh. Anton Fig was on drums. Awesome. After the show was over with, I saw a backstage door. And I walked through the backstage door and I walked up to George Suet, who I recognized from, you know, Kiss oh, yeah, videos yeah, yeah. and him being on the road with Kiss. And I walked up to him. I said, George Suet. And he looked at me and goes, who the fuck are you? <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? Here? And I said, I'm David Snowden. I've called you a couple times. I've left you messages. You haven't returned my call. So here I am. And he just said, you know what? He said, it takes a lot of balls. And he said, Anton, hold on to this guy. Don't let him go anywhere. He said, I'll be right back. And he went to another room. And eventually, when he came out of the room, he took me back. Ace was sitting in the room by himself. He introduced me to Ace. He told Ace that I wanted to do an interview. We weren't going to do it that day, but we would do it later. And two weeks later, I'm talking to Ace from the power station recording studio when he was recording a scratch vocal for Into the Night. Uh, Hi, can I speak David. to Ace? Yeah. Hi, Ace. How you doing, Ace? I was just about to do a vocal on a track. Oh, okay. So what time would be best for me to call you back? Well, you know, if we can do this real quick, we can do it right now, because I'm going to be working straight through. Okay. Um, well, the first question I had was, um, how did you start Frilly's Comet? Come again? How did you start Frilly's Comet? How did I start? Yeah. A couple weeks after that, George was so happy with the way it went, and Ace was so happy that Keith and I were invited to the Hard Rock Cafe in New York City to watch Ace skip one of his smoking guitars. As we're walking into the Hard Rock, who do we walk into but Billy Joel, wow. which was real exciting to meet so him. Exciting. And then we go in, we sit down, Ace is up there, he's getting ready to give away the guitar, and it was one of his smoking ones. And then it didn't work, and Ace went, it doesn't fucking work. And then he's, he goes, you can have it. And give, you know, and that was the station to oh the hard drive. How do you continue with your career? Uh, I know you are managing some bands. I know <laughs> you produce some bands and also uh, take care of uh, graphics and uh, all the merchandising and marketing of the bands. Tell me about oh, it. Oh, well, I, I have um, the band Silver Tongue. I've been with them now for about four years. And in that time, we've actually had three singles that have been on the Billboard radio chart Ooh. in the top 40, which is pretty exciting for them. Exciting. They've got uh, a full-length DVD that we put out. We've put out a few records. time besides that i got another band called the kelly bell band okay. kelly bell does a very unique uh eclectic kind of mix of all different kind of music okay. they call it it's their own genre they call it fat blues, fat blues. Okay. it has blues in it it has funk in it it has rock in oh, it cool. you know it's a little bit of everything to do what the blues did for me which is expose other young folks to this American entity that really is the foundation of all popular music. Her 
And it's funny because the first time I met Kelly, which was about 20 years ago, he hired me to do the layout and design for his CD. And he played me the new music and I said to him, I don't get it. And he said, come see us live. And I put it off for about six months. Then he told me he was going to record a live CD, he wanted me to come out. So I finally did. And uh, after the show, I said to him, now I get it. Oh. It's like, it, that's one of those bands that you see it live and then you understand it. And then you start to love the music with it. And he's currently finishing up a new record. So I'm working with him on some stuff. Excellent. John Chet. Tell me about Over the Jet. years, I've done that for a lot of other bands, like Joan Jett was one, all during the uh, 90s and in the 2000s. I mean, I did all of her merchandising and, you know, put all that stuff together for them, helped them with the marketing and all that sort of stuff. And when she was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, that was incredible. You know, I mean, that to me felt like a personal victory for me because here's a lady who is absolutely one of the kindest people you'll ever meet. And, but at the same time, she's kind of like a big sister to me. And, you know, she's not afraid to look at me and say, you know, fuck you, baby. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, you know, when I see her, she will embrace me. She will give me a kiss. Aww. She will tell me she loves me, that sort of stuff. Excellent. That's the kind of person that she was, you know, that she is. And when she got into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it was like, wow, this is like my friend. Nice, that, nice, nice, nice. You know? okay. yeah. David, tell me about your highlight. Tell me about the moment in your career. Tell me about what made you most proud of all the time. Oh, gosh, there's so many. And, you know, I think that the best, if I had to pick a highlight of something that happened to me that it struck me in such an emotional way, and made me feel so good, it actually happened last month. I was nominated for a Maryland Music Award, and they nominated me for Music Icon. And I'm like, cool. Music Icon? And this was, you know, a, you know, people had made nominations and stuff, but then they have a panel of people that decide who's going to be the nominees and who, who aren't. And I don't, I honestly don't believe that I will win that award, but just to be nominated, I mean, when you're looking at the state of Maryland, I mean, it's, it's a great, vast amount of music that are here. There are a lot of people, a lot of great people that have come out of Maryland. Yeah, tell me about the fans. Tell me about your friends, all, all the, the people you met down the road. And, um, but, you know, that's fun, you know, and they're great memories for me. And then even after we came back from Indy, You know, I was sending emails to people asking for the pictures because I wanted them for me. Cool. That means something to me. I mean, it's like, yeah, it's great to have a picture with all the members of KISS and that sort of stuff. But, you know, it's also great to have pictures with the fans and the people who enjoy this, the people Absolutely. that relate to you one-on-one, -on -one, yeah. that understand your obsession with this whole thing. Yeah. Because not everybody does, you know, especially as we get older People are like, wow, you still listen to Kiss? And it's like, yeah, they're, they still do it. You know? They still, you know? David, I want to thank you so, so much for your time. You are my friend. You are a great manager, great producer. You have done so much for music. <laughs> I hope that we can meet each other again in, in the expo. Oh, anyway. we definitely will. You got my number, so anytime you need me, you call me, thank okay? Thank you, David. Take care, brother. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care, Max. Bye -bye.